Hello, welcome to Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. My name is Dylan Turk, and I'm excited to take you around our 120-acre campus to showcase the beautiful Moshe Softy design building that we call our home, and tell you some other things that are happen happening within our architectural program. First, I wanna tell you a little bit about how we started. We were founded by Alice Walton. Alice Walton grew up here in Bentonville, Arkansas. The land that we're standing on was actually her family's land for a very, very long time. In 2005, she started this museum. We opened on 11-11-11. What's important is that her fundamental belief that the power of art can change us. The building that I'm standing in is representative to me that art is expansive. Architecture, art, painting, sculpture, all of these things come together to help us tell our story in a place that is always free because for Alice, access was everything to be able to open up this community, a place that had never had an art museum before, and understand how this region would change with the powers of the stories that we will tell here today. If you look behind me in this 120-acre campus, we're settled down in this little ravine, and I like to think about this place untouched, like the, the little creek that runs behind me before this place ever happened here. Something incredible about Crystal Bridges is our understanding that nature and our connectedness to it is what makes us human. The rolling undulating hills, the water, the tree canopy and stone is critical in defining what Ozark architecture is and also is important to the artisans that we bring here and helping them define our voice and our architectural vocabulary as an institution. We're gonna have a great day today. We're going to see a lot. And thank you so much for, for tuning in and welcome to Crystal Bridges. siblings grew up here in Bentonville in a Faye Jones house designed in 1957. Those long lines, open spaces and natural materials, I think really opened their mind up to how architecture and art collide with the natural world. When deciding to build a, an art museum here in Bentonville, she knew that the architecture would be the guiding spine to be able to make the community center, the art space actually come alive and connect with the Arkansas landscape. She uh, had been in Los Angeles and ended up visiting with the Skirball Cultural Center in Los Angeles. And this building is designed by Moshe Softy. After seeing that space and inviting Softy into uh, the land at which we're standing, they instantly decided that they'd be working together. So we're going to be talking about today Moshe Softy, this incredible, incredible architect that is spanning global boundaries and global borders. Moshe Softy's ideas that you can humanize mega scale, use materials to help reflect the aura of the natural setting and, and, and the place that which you're building can help make people feel comfortable and familiar. Softy's vision here for Crystal Bridges helps us do that. It's long and low and glides itself through the landscape, reflecting the rolling hills of the Ozarks. We're gonna dive deep into materials, light, and the space that makes this place incredible. But Moshe Softy is the reason that Crystal Bridges has been able to break boundaries and help people see themselves within art, nature, and architecture. Something fundamental to Alice Walton's vision for this place was that an art museum that is rooted within the community and how we experience art. So Moshe Softy's lean into the curvature of the natural ravine, the use of Arkansas wood above you, creates a very unique experience for looking at art. And we are an art museum at our heart. And so this long sweep that runs down the space actually gives our visitors this holistic shot of, of a run of art history, while also allowing for truly intimate and personal experiences with individual artworks. What I also love about our galleries is if you look up, you'll see the curvature of the Arkansas glue laminated beams that run down. The high side of every gallery is always up the ravine and the low side at water's edge. So without even knowing it, Softy's orienting us within our landscape and within the entire campus. 
When I think about talking about architecture, I always start with how does the building nestle itself into the landscape? And I think there's no better example of a building that does that than, than this building. As you can see behind me, the features actually float and hug the edge, of the edge of the ravine. The shapes of the roof behind me are there to articulate potentially the forms of Ozark rolling hillsides. To me, situating this building on water automatically pulls peace throughout the campus. It feels as if it's floating. And the relationship with the natural world is profound. I always like to talk that the natural world here at Crystal Bridges is always our exhibition. It's constant, it's ever-changing. The colors of the leaves uh, change the colors inside of the building. They change the color of the water. Something that's so fascinating when I talk about the peace and the lightness of this space is that it's really filled with tensions and juxtapositions, which is critical to understanding Moshe Safdie's work. The concrete appears to be light and float on top of the water, while the glass occupies the space where we would expect the most tension and pressure. So that tension and that juxtaposition of our understanding of materials already establishes us to be questioning our world, to open us to conversations that we'll be having within the galleries. If you look behind me, you'll see one of the most incredible engineering feats of this entire property, and that's the suspension system. The roofs of three buildings are completely held in place by a suspension cable. It connects to the concrete abutments, it runs down the entire edge of the roof line, and it's essentially like an upside down suspension bridge. If you were to remove the vertical poles and the glass, the building would still stand, the roof would float. This is the moment when Moshe Safdie combines the artistry of place, materials, and understanding of form with an engineering revolution. And so you collide these two things together, and to me, that's great architecture. This is one of my favorite spaces in the museum because to me it has that tight compressedness that opens up into the true beauty and monumentality of the space. All the wood above us is Arkansas pine. And to me, this is that tension, that juxtaposition where the engineering, the reason the building is standing is the beauty. That all of these beams serve a function of holding the roof above our head, but it also creates pattern. Uh, repetition and an overall composition that to me is truly delightful. Situated within our campus, this is the Great Hall. And from here, you can see a long uh, kind of view all the way through the entire campus. You can see the engineering systems of the suspension beams and the cables that dive down into the anchors of the pond behind me. You can also see the form of the building, 11, which is our restaurant. That Ozark hillside, and that articulation of the building appearing to almost float across the water's edge. Below it is a labyrinth weir, which is a type of dam that actually holds the water back, creating this pond. So this is a natural water source that flows throughout our campus. It's about half a million gallons of water throughout the campus every 24 hours. You'll also see the light, the reflective quality of the water and how every part of the building becomes highlighted with the natural light. The, the concrete showcasing shadow and brightness. Moshe Safdi talks about that the magic, the soul of this building comes across in how the light interacts with the space. So you'll see there's reflections of light dancing on the beams above, the pattern cast as the light sweeps in behind, and the reflective quality of the glass itself, which if you look deep into it, actually helps show us another building. So we're constantly seeing potential places we can go and the interaction between the landscape and the natural building. One of my favorite places to talk about uh, form and how this building really did follow along the ridge and pathways is you can see the sea corridor collide into the other form with the administration building there. And that I think is magic. And it's one of the subtle things that people often don't look at. 
But in that moment, we get the entire understanding of the whole campus, water, simplicity, simplicity in concrete form, and the weathering on the exterior with that cedar wood and concrete totally absorbing the world that's happening around them. Part of Moshe Softy's vision for this building was that the materials would be a major narrative in how we understand the building's relationship with the natural world. Every material he chose was considered so that it could help us understand its place within the landscape, but also how we interpret and understand our environment and its relationship to buildings. If you look behind me on the beautiful curving roof lines, you'll notice the brown material, this metal, and this is copper. This copper was chosen specifically because it ages, it patinas, and that patina is the magic. That's the beauty. For Softy, he wasn't thinking about this perfection of the day that it opened, but really it was about how it would look in 10, 50, 100 years. And all of the concrete which is cast in place was left untreated so that it's almost a blank canvas for the natural world to record its life on. This shows us the building's life. And that, I think, so many times with architecture is overlooked, that a building should live, it should be able to showcase people intersecting with it and doesn't have to be perfect. One of my favorite examples about that is the wood banding, the cedar banding. On this side over here, you'll notice the cedar banding is gray, it's silvered. It's almost the same color as the concrete. And that's because it's received direct harsh light, water runoff, and, and creates a subtle pattern. But as you move on other parts of the camp, on campus, you'll see the same wood is rich, dark, muddy brown. And that's because it's protected by the eaves. There's no longer rain directly running over the top of it. This is magic for Softy. When he visited here a couple of years ago, um, I had the pleasure of walking around with him and we went up on the view of the North Tower and he pulled out his phone and took a photograph. And he took a photograph because he said, this was incredible. It had exceeded his vision. And I think when working with architects and artists to be able to see how something is articulated in the real world as compared to their mind is incredible, especially if it exceeds their expectations. So the architecture here is about place. It's about human interaction with it. And it isn't always perfect. It is here to live and absorb and facilitate incredible interactions with people. After engaging with such an amazing architect like Moshe Safdi, we realize that architecture is going to be a foundational pillar of everything that we do at the museum. Being in Northwest Arkansas means that there's actually a really deep and long history of architecture here. Um, it first started um, with some amazing, amazing architects that were the founders of the Architecture School, which is now the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design at the University of Arkansas. The founder, John G. Williams, was actually a professor within the College of Engineering. And what they did is pull in the characteristics of, of modernity, clean lines, open spaces, honesty of materials, but connect with and celebrate materials and shapes found in vernacular architecture of the early settlers of this area. So one of my favorite stories to tell is that uh, famed international architect Edward Durrell Stone was actually born in Fayetteville, Arkansas. He actually went to the University of Arkansas. He didn't graduate there. Um, but he ended up building as magnificent of buildings as the Museum of Modern Art in 1935 um, to the Kennedy Center. And so the rich history of creation here in the built environment extends well into the 50s and into the late 40s, actually. So when we were thinking about telling a broadened story of what architecture would be, connecting with contemporary ideas, we realized we had to tell the story uh, that's happening here. We had to pull on the stories from Edward Durrell Stone, which leads to Faye Jones. Faye Jones has an incredible legacy as an Arkansan born and raised. He ended up actually being a part of the first graduating class at the University of Arkansas 
um, in the architecture program. Now the school bears his name. What he did was take the ideas that were taught to him by legends like Frank Lloyd Wright and connect to the soul of what it means to be working in the Ozarks. His idea was that you could have this circuitous path wandering through the woods just like we're walking today. That you could lean into the fact that there are natural stones, colors, woods, and materials of this place that regionalize the ideas of modernism that we see in places like Palm Springs um, or outside of Chicago. So one thing that I always like to tell people when we are talking about Crystal Bridges, which is relatively new, is that we're not bringing architecture here. We're helping uplift the stories that already exist and tap into a deep rooted architectural program that is anchored by the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design. And we're gonna talk more about that as we continue. In keeping with our belief of working with and celebrating the next generation of architects, we selected Marlon Blackwell to design the interior of the museum store. He was inspired by and, and guided by the art artistic vision of Moshe Safdi, but looked at something a little bit more localized to the Ozarks, which is the underside of a mushroom. So if you look up, each piece of plywood was laser cut and every single one is different. The uniqueness here creates a pattern and a beauty that Marlon Blackwell, who won the AIA Gold Medal Award last year, believed celebrates a modern view of what Ozark architecture should be. We're standing on the front lawn of Frank Lloyd Wright's Bachman Wilson House. Originally, it was designed in 1953, and shocker, it wasn't built here. It was in Millstone, New Jersey. And I'll tell you the story of how it got here a little bit later. But first, I wanna contextualize Frank Lloyd Wright and why Crystal Bridges felt that this house needed to be a major outpost in our architectural program. First, Wright was born in 1867 and died in 1959. And so if you think about the end of the Civil War all the way to the beginning of the space race, what he saw and how much our society changed, his architectural ideas completely shifted American housing and how we were to live. This is a Usonian house. And this came from a, a term uh, called Usonia, United States of North America. And it was an idea that there could be an architectural principle book that would allow for architecture to touch more people, creating better access to great design. Frank Lloyd Wright built his first Usonian house in 1934 in Madison, Wisconsin. And the concepts were this, that there was available land outside of the city center automobiles were becoming more accessible. And so now more Americans, middle-class Americans could buy a home designed by a great architect. Some of the interesting principles and how did he achieve affordability, attainability um, with such great design were materials, his use of space and shifting the housing type. So this whole house, all of the gray you see is completely constructed of concrete block, off the shelf concrete block. But one of the ways that he makes it more interesting and beautiful and, and, and lighten up to his uh, ideas that had been established in Chicago earlier in his career was by raking out the horizontal mortar joints, but filling in the vertical ones to be flush with the top of the block. So it creates horizontality. Wright says many, many times that one, nature is his God. He capitalized the word nature. And he said buildings should run across the ground rather than up and away from them. All of the wood on this house is mahogany, Philippine mahogany, which when we say that now, we are kind of shocked in thinking in that in the same statement as affordability. But at the time, it was actually a wood that was very inexpensive and primarily used as shipping crate material because it's so strong and durable. What else he did was changed how we used housing. And for us, this is why this house is a pillar in our architectural program. Because what he said is that we should acknowledge the automobile as part of our procession. So you imagine this is the driveway running um, below me, running around into the carport, which is a, t a term that he coined with the Usonian idea. And so he integrates the car, which is funny to me that it wasn't before, which is something so American. 
And so for us, this is a story about using design, using architecture, using creativity to make beauty more accessible, to change the lives of everyday Americans. And that's something that we also embody with our mission in the museum. And so as we started to work on this extended program, these are the areas that we lean into and these are the stories that we tell. As you can see, the back is a total contrast to the front of the home. The front had this long, hard fortress-like wall where the back is open, glass-filled, primarily composed of the mahogany. And this was part of Wright's idea of Usonian housing, that here it would be open and connected to the, to the outdoors, that the living space spilled out onto this patio, while the front was a hard edge towards the street. So if you follow me inside, There's a seamlessness that happens of inside, outside, that's very, very important to Wright's work. He wanted this to be boundaryless. If you notice, if you look around the room, every place in a corner where you would expect there to be a solid is all glass. Um, it's open and light filled within this crown of ornamentation in the windows around you. His idea was that through beauty, through simple sophistication, we can make a space work we can redefine how we live by creating an open, large living space to promote communication among family members. He was directly trying to change the kind of Victorian boxy uh, way of building that we had done in America in the past and pull housing quickly into the future of what Americans needed. This house in 1953 cost $30,000. The equivalent today with inflation is about $257,000. And to me, that's an astonishing feat to be able to create something so architecturally significant, so beautiful, so sensual in the materials, but also do it on an attainable way. His idea was that there would be thousands of homes like this one, each unique but guided by a set of principles and materials that would help keep the costs low. The more that we would build, the more the cost would be low. They didn't take off in the way that he expected, but architecture and housing were always a part of his work. And I think this home for us at Crystal Bridges represents the possibilities of creativity and innovation colliding and how art, even in the way that we build and the way that we live, changes society, can move society forward. And after we, brought this house here and did a complicated reconstruction, which I'm about to tell you about, we learned that our guests connect to that, that we had a duty to shift and guide our architectural program to housing and to talk about these ideas. How do you move a Frank Lloyd Wright house across the country? Well, it's complicated. This house was, was originally built in Millstone, New Jersey, like I said, and there was a, a river that ran behind it. And that river ended up flooding this house multiple times, the first time in the 70s, the last time in 2010. And it was significant. The water went well into the second floor of the house. And the people who were living in the house realized that um, it couldn't be saved, that they needed a savior. They ended up contacting Crystal Bridges because they understood and believed in the access that we were providing. They believed in the fact that we were in the heartland of Faye Jones, who was an apprentice of Frank Lloyd Wright's, and that we could help tell the story of architecture and Frank Lloyd Wright here. So we literally pulled down the pieces and took the entire house apart, wrapped every board, screw, piece of furniture, and shipped it 1,200 miles where we started the reconstruction process here. We opened the house in November of 2015, and it has been one of the most popular and engaging elements of architecture on our grounds um, since opening. It's changed what we do. So I really hope you can see the joy and the beauty and the um, artistic celebration that architecture can have in housing and here at Crystal Bridges.
After we installed the Frank Lloyd Wright house on our grounds, we realized that architecture needed to be more than just our building, that to connect and tell the real stories of what it means to have shelter and that connection with art in American housing, we needed to push into innovation. Behind me is an amazing structure by Buckminster Fuller, and, and this helps us expand our program. We're being very intentional in how we talk about the history of architectural past and how that guides us to an architectural future. And so everything that we do now is, is trying to make architecture more accessible, attainable, and tell the story of how we live and how that intersects with art and architecture. Buckminster Fuller was born in 1895 and died in 1983. His entire life's work was about using architecture, engineering, and design to push humanity forward. He made comments that we can build a world that supports 100% of humanity, that if we work together through creative and innovative new methods of building, we can change the housing type. We can change how we live. The, work, the structure that we're standing in is called the Flyzy Dome. It was his last idea. It was something he started in the late 1960s, and his belief was that if we create a kit, essentially, of panels that we can pour liquid fiberglass into, this house can be shipped anywhere. He was very, very famously uh, would ask architects, uh, how much does your building weigh? Because his judge of if your building was sustainable or not was about its weight. Most architects can't tell you how much your building weighs, but he always knew. This dome weighs 10,000 pounds, which he felt was a step in the right direction of a sustainable and attainable architectural system. This is actually a prototype for a house. He thought that this would be a single family dwelling. Um, it might have three floors in it. Over all of the 61 oculi, there would be these kind of glass domes so that natural light could pour in. And he believed truly that something like this could exist in any climate, it could ship all over the globe, and it could be totally self-sustaining off the grid. This prototype that we're standing in um, was shown to the public for the first time in 1981 as the information pavilion at the Los Angeles Bicentennial Celebration. There, he tried to use this as a beacon to represent the future of where we're going in humanity and a spark with hopes that it could change how we live. I'm thrilled that this is at Crystal Bridges because we use it just like that. It's a prototype. It's not a single family house. It's an idea. It's a concept that's abstract. And so for us, it's a way to challenge what we think about, to, to question the housing type, and to hopefully spark contemporary practitioners to think about the future and how we might exist and live tomorrow. Great architecture evolves, shifts, grows, to be able to support what the program of the building is doing. We've done some incredible new expansion opportunities with Moshe Softy Architects, one of which I'm standing on right now, which is a 100 foot long bridge that connects the lowest part of our outdoor grounds with the tallest part. So now our guests are able to actually spend a 360 degree experience outdoors and connect with nature and see artistic interventions within the natural world. We're also expanding our lobby. We're enclosing the space with a Moshe Softy design glass dome, which will allow us to function better and allow our guests to communicate with each other more. The other major thing that's happening right now is Moshe Softy is currently working on designs for a significant gallery expansion. On the north lawn, he will have built a series of buildings that are very much in the aesthetic and experience of Crystal Bridges, but they'll be in the Moshe Softy of today. It's been 10 years since he designed this building. This is one of the most incredible things about working with an architect over a period of time, is we get to see his spaces grow and evolve and shift. So this new space will have more gallery spaces, it will allow our guests to connect to the natural world, and it will help us further our mission and our program. Finally, 
architecture isn't over here in how it serves our goals, but also how we talk about it and exhibit it. In 2022, we will be doing a significant outdoor architectural exhibition that features contemporary practitioners from North America in their innovation and exploration of American housing. And this is not the end, it's just the beginning. We continue to challenge what we do and tell more diverse stories that speak to what it means to be alive today. We're at the Momentary, which is a new contemporary art space that's a satellite of Crystal Bridges Museum. We opened this in February of 2020 and I mentioned it earlier, but I wanna point this out because it has a significant a uh, new program to what we're doing at Crystal Bridges. It's a non-collecting institution that showcases contemporary art, performance, and culinary. This was once a cheese factory, and now it's our new art space. One of the significant artistic interventions here on the campus is this tall tower that skyrockets behind me. The pattern that you see on the glass was designed by Osage artist Addie Roanhorse. You can see this pattern uh, repeating throughout the museum. Her entire design was to pay homage to the original inhabitants of this land. And this is something critical to the ideas and values here at the Momentary. This space was done by uh, Wheeler Kearns out of Chicago with great expertise in adaptive reuse in their portfolio. Here they left certain elements that may look unpolished or it's like something that you may want to remove, uh, like piping and signage, but then added really crisp contemporary elements to create that juxtaposition. This is part of our Crystal Bridges family, and it tells another story, another way of working. And as one of my favorite architectural theorists said, sometimes the greenest building is the building that's already standing. We've seen a lot of spaces today. We've talked about landscape, we've talked about buildings, and how they make us feel how we at Crystal Bridges use them as a tool to talk about art, to talk about people's stories. I hope that you walk away from this understanding the power of architecture, how it can change a society, how it can talk about an idea whose time has come. It also is a way to bring people in, to make a space inclusive, to tell a diverse story set. And that is always our goal at Crystal Bridges from Moshe Softy to Marlon Blackwell to Frank Lloyd Wright to Buckminster Fuller. We long to tell the stories of these people in their past, but how we interpret them now. So I hope that you can take some of this with you. You can appreciate the buildings and homes in your community with a little bit more joy, a little more soul. So thank you so much for coming on this journey with us and, and getting to explore um, the spaces that we get to enjoy here in Arkansas at Crystal Bridges. Come back, come see us again. Again, my name is Dylan Turk and thank you so much for letting us go on this journey together.